I'm just curious, just thought I would throw this out here first. How many of you have heard about the Artist in Residence program at Recology? Or Who's Blue? the microphone? Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> hi. How many of you have heard of the Artist in Residence program at Recology or have come on a tour or attended a reception? Oh, quite a few. Excellent. Great. So, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, just start with a little overview of the program and then get into talking to, about more specific artists. Right. So just sort of the place where the residency is, um, Recology San Francisco is the solid waste transfer and recycling center for the city of San Francisco. So it's a 47 acre facility. It's the transfer station for San Francisco. And this building may be vaguely familiar to people who drive north on Highway 101. Um, it's kind of opposite um, Candlestick Point. It's on the west side of the road. Um, and that's um, where Recology San Francisco and the residence program is. Um, and Recology is an employee-owned private company. We work closely with the city of San Francisco. Um, and we trace our history back to turn of the century, 19th century uh, San Francisco. We've got some great classic photos of uh, workers from the earlier part of the 20th century. And the Artist in Residence program was developed um, 24 years ago, and it was the brainchild of this woman, Jo Hansen. And Jo was an artist uh, and an activist uh, commissioner at the San Francisco Arts Commission, someone who was instrumental in the saving of the Lucien Lebeau murals, if you're familiar with those murals that are in the Beach Chalet, beautiful WPA era murals there. So, and Jo, in her own personal art practice, she would sweep in front of her home in the Lower Haight and collect what she was finding and put it in these big um, books that became these sort of biographies of her community, the materials that she was finding. Um, and then she started to organize um, tours of public dumping sites in the city and then citywide street sweeping campaigns. Um, and eventually there was an exhibition in San Francisco Hall uh, of her work. And it became uh, apparent to the city um, the work that she was doing, and they wanted her to come out to the transfer station where the materials she was collecting were going um, so she could see where they were going. And when she got there and saw all the reusable materials that artists um, would love to have access to, uh, she conceived of the Artist Residence Program. And we stayed pretty true to her original vision of the program today. Um, this also coincided with the beginning of curbside recycling in San Francisco. And the city really liked this idea. They were doing all kinds of education and outreach uh, to people to encourage them to recycle, to teach them how recycling um, helps protect the environment and conserves natural resources. So this art program was just seemed like another really innovative educational tool at that time. And there's a quote from Joe. Joe really felt passionately about, um, about how art can really touch people and reach people on a more profound, um, deep, emotional level on, with regard to some of these issues in a way completely different um, than, say, what, how you respond to reading a book. So she was really a proponent for the power of, of, of art. So the program's mission. Um, Oh, that text looks so fuzzy up there. It's wild. Um, is to uh, support Bay Area, Bay Area artists and um, to inspire and, and educate the public about reuse and resource conservation. Uh, this is the art studio. So um, the art studio also becomes the exhibition space during the course of a residency. So an artist is in residence for four months. This is Jane Kim working in the studio. And then at the end of the four months, it becomes the gallery. And so this is the cleaned up gallery there. This is where the artists scavenge. So they do not scavenge the materials that people put in their trash cans in San Francisco, because that would be really gross. <laughs> they scavenge in this building, which is the public disposal area. And it's where, um, you know, when we think of going to the public dump, it's where people are self-hauling materials in. Um, they're usually cleaner, a lot of small construction companies, people cleaning out their attics and their basements. 
Um, he gives them safety gear, extensive safety training, and a shopping cart. And then you just send them this in there. Mm -hmm. So the artist uh, receives a thousand dollar stipend each month for four months. Uh, supplies, we have an exhibition, we produce postcards. We always get sent to the really great um, media coverage. Uh, it's such an unusual program. Um, and obviously um, access to materials and we have a very good shop that they have access to. And then they are expected to work in the studio and, and meet uh, tour groups. So we have kind of an extensive tour program. Um, and then they also give us three pieces of art for our permanent art collection. We do offsite exhibitions with their artwork. So the selection process works. Um, we accept uh, applications during the summer months uh, through the end of August. We have an uh, advisory panel made up of arts professionals, environmental professionals, and former artists who select people to come in for interviews. And then of those interviewed, we select six finalists uh, to uh, receive residencies. And that usually happens in November. So um, we also do many exhibitions and tours. So uh, this was a anniversary exhibition we did for our 20th anniversary at the Intersection for the Arts in San Francisco. Um, but if anyone flew on United last year, you may have um, seen a major exhibition we had at the San Francisco International Airport. So we had over 100 pieces in their biggest exhibition space in the airport. It was fantastic. Um, they say something like three to four million people see the exhibitions there. So it was great. Um, we were very honored to have our work there. Um, so the other thing we do are tours. We work clo closely with the Department of the Environment that schedules tours for children in grades three through six to come tour the facility and a stop the visiting the artists is always a highlight of that tour. And then we do two public tours a month and a lot of special tours with special groups. So probably about four or 5,000 people each year come on tours. Okay, so now I'm gonna Speak about some of the artists um, who have uh, come through the program. So this is Remy Rubel. Uh, in the early years of the program, there was a real emphasis on social practice in the artist's work. And so Remy was our third artist in residence. Uh, and she collaborated with 45 members of the Youth in Action Group, which are part of the San Francisco Conservation Corps. And these were um, kids ranging in age from 12 to 14. And they made this um, enormous bottle cap mural, which is actually still outside our main administrative building. Um, and you know, it was a really great opportunity for the kids to work with reused materials, to work with a professional artist. Remy got to work on a larger scale um, than she had before. And then she worked with it again on a second piece, which uh, was cited in the lobby of Fort Mason's Cowell Theater, which was 15 by 9 feet, 8,500 bottle caps in that piece. Estelle Akamini um, is a textile artist and made these art to wear pieces out of crazy materials. These are six pack holders, and mini blinds, computer ribbon tape. And so these clothes were worn to the black and white ball in San Francisco, you know, it's this kind of fancy thing where people wear black and white clothes. So they wore them there as sort of an environmental statement at the ball. Susan Leibovitz Steinman. Um, it was an artist who uh, produced a, a, a range of work during her residency, but she also envisioned a sculpture garden on the hill that was an empty hill uh, in the middle of our facility. And that sculpture garden is, is now been built. It was designed and built by, by Susan. And the centerpiece of the garden is this uh, work called The River of Hopes and Dreams. So Susan worked with uh, 75 students from Philip and Salaburton High School, which is a nearby high school. Um, and the kids wrote their feelings and thoughts and ideas for the future in the wet concrete. And this is now the centerpiece of the garden. And this is something that everyone on tours of the facility comes and visits this garden. And we have now probably artists um, have contributed sculptures over the years, probably about 40, 40 
school trees in the garden here. So when artists apply to our program, they um, have to give a proposal of what they intend to do during their residency. Um, many artists have already worked with reclaimed materials, that's just part of their practice, but for some other people, they, they've never worked with, with um, materials like this, and they just want to uh, challenge themselves. So we're totally open to that. Um, really, we want people who are making good work, who can kind of rise to the occasion and produce a body of work. Um, in four months and deal with the challenges the residency um, poses. So, you know, some people are making work that does have kind of an environmental or a political subtext to the work, but I would say even for people whose work um, weren't, wasn't addressing issues prior to coming to the dump, um, there's a way in which scavenging every day, looking through all the things, all the like amazing um, cast off, casts off of our crazy consumer culture really activates people and really can politicize people over these issues. So David Pebble was an artist whose work um, had to do, always has had to do with kind of the gluttonous excess of pop culture and celebrity and just kind of like, you know, these crazy over the top sculptures. And he'd always gone to um, you know, the dollar store to buy the materials that he was using in these sculptures. And, and when he got to the dump and he saw that a lot of the stuff that he was buying was there, being thrown away, all these cheaply, poorly made, predominantly plastic things that are, are, are just you know, used once and thrown away, he, he was just profoundly affected. And it totally changed his working process. He now never buys that sort of stuff new. Um, and so, and then he produced this crazy uh, shopping, shopping crazed monkey piece. <laughs> Andrew Yanni, when he came, I don't think he ever anticipated making a giant styrofoam hummer. But um, he was seeing so much, um, so much styrofoam coming through the facility and, and knowing that styrofoam has this really negative uh, impact on the environment. He was trying to think of what's sort of an analogous thing I could make that is equally um, kind of horrible for our environment. We saw a Hummer parked on the street, these giant gas guzzling vehicles. And so he actually asked the guy if he could take dimensions of it and made this two scale Hummer vehicle. This was actually in the airport exhibition. They put it right in the middle of the United Terminal where those long um, people reverse things are. It's pretty fabulous. So another theme that seems to have been appearing um, with some frequency in artist work is this idea of a post-apocalyptic kind of scenario, right? Some sort of probably environmentally induced environmental uh, apocalyptic kind of scene, and so James Sanson makes these pieces um, that kind of don't translate so well in photographs, but they're sculptures, they mount to the wall, probably like three by four in size, but they're just amazing. He, um, they're, they're these sort of barren urban scenes, totally des desolate scenes, no signs of human life, the tires are tiny because he's taken them off of, of toy cars and trucks. The bricks that make the the bricks that make the walls, he's carved full-size bricks into tiny little bricks to make these crumbling environments. So the only thing kind of life force are the vines that are, that are um, growing over these abandoned cities. Scott Kildall came with a proposal that he was going to be a prospector from the year 2049, um, that we have somehow screwed up the planet so badly we had to abandon it. Um, he's been sent off by whatever mothership we're living on to come back to Earth and see if there's any salvageable materials. So he writes missives back to the mothership, forms of these letters, and then he creates devices. He um, makes his own inventions and the blueprints for those inventions to survive while he's here. So this um, thing on the left is called a sniffer. It's a weed whacker with a mannequin head on the front and like a little <laughs> gas mask thing. And so he used that to make sure he wasn't gonna 
encounter any uh, dangerous toxins as you walked around Denver. Another artist, Jeff Short, also sort of embracing this um, dystopic kind of view of, of what might be left to work with, what you'd have to cobble together. Um, uh, and so a lot of, obviously, humor in his work. He was also um, very much inspired by Mad, Mad Max, the movie Mad Max. So this is a working refrigerator with a Budweiser can in there with a hammer. Um, and then the piece on the right is called the Grill of Steel. Um, it's a working barbecue grill. It's got a turntable, CD player, tape decks, a karaoke machine, a smoke machine. It's just got it all. Um, so very, you know, humorous, but also with this underlying other message, though, about just sort of making um, making do with these these castoffs. Okay, I'm going to turn to my paper for this. So in 2001, we began a student artist residency. And um, it's very similar to our professional artist residency, only students work in a shipping container behind your building. Um, but they get the same access to materials and they get an exhibition at the end um, of the four months. And in fact, our current student artist in residence is a undergrad art student at Stanford named Claire Lynch. So uh, we love Stanford, we get a lot of Stanford students. So um, Robin Lasser, even though now we have individual students do this residency, um, for the early years, teachers um, brought students. So Robin in her class, she was a teacher, photography at San Jose State University came. Um, and this is, so the kids did their own photography on site, but Robin also did her own work and she took this picture and then she also created a video that's called Dining at the Dump. So scenes from the video include us are standing at the transfer station at a conveyor belt normally used at the facility for sorting recyclable materials. In this case, snack foods and beverages passed by the artist as she grabs and consumes what she can from the never-ending stream. The conveyor belt moves more rapidly, the ambient noise of the facility gets louder and more overwhelming, and you know, through equating consumer uh, consumption with the physical consumption of food brings this really strong <coughs> visual component to the work. So it's kind of like a literal consumer-driven nausea analogy she was making. So Packer Jennings um, is an artist who is best known for his what he calls shop throp actions. It's where he's done things like put um, anarchist action figure, figures on toy shelves next to Barbie and G.I. Joe. Um, and his work often calls attention to the transgressions of corporate, political, and religious institutions, including their environmental offenses. So he was here during sort of the peak of, uh, remember the Homeland Security color-coded threat levels? Remember those? So this is actually a sign that's about six feet tall, and it's got these switched out interchangeable messages that he actually put on the street in San Francisco. Um, and then the landfill vending machine was just, uh, he found a bunch of vending machines and really just wanted to highlight how quickly the meaning of goods shift from desired possessions to garbage so quickly. So Bill Baskin, one minute, oh dear. Okay, I'm gonna be really quick. Bill Baskin, um, Bill Baskin focused on composting during his residency. He took pictures of food as it was decomposing, as well as creating a chamber that people could get in and sit on a pile of compost and really kind of experience the smells of the compost. <laughs> Suzanne Husky attributes uh, growing up in France during the years of Francois Mitterrand's um, presidency as shaping her ideological views and her appreciation for the rural environment. Her work addresses land use, environmental exploitation, and our relationship with nature, as well as globalization and how individuals and communities respond to the, its impact. And her sculptures 
um, address serious issues that often have a playful or humorous quality, um, and which allows to, uh, this ability to pull people in to some of these bigger issues. So these are the pieces she made during her residency. They're charming. They're kind of like from a fairy tale, right? She's out. They have wheels. They're habitable. You know, several people can get inside of them. Um, but she calls them sleeper cells. So then suddenly there's this whole other layer of meaning, and she's thinking about, you know, eco terrorists maybe using these to, you know, amass out in the woods, or just all the kinds of different possibilities um, using the term sleeper cell for these words. And then I'm just going to close with two Stanford um, artists. So Gary Berlier is a professor here in the art department and did a residency with us in 2012. Um, and just uh, point out this one specific piece, which is a shopping cart filled with concrete. Um, you can't tell what the name on the shopping cart and the name of the piece is Smart and Final, the store for which it came. Hmm. Ethan Estes was a student artist in residence with us, and he uh, was doing an interdisciplinary master's degree that had to do with the marine biology and visual arts. So this piece on the right is called Last Dive at the Farallons, 10 100 marine mammals killed per year. And that's about eight feet across. And then the, the photo on the left is uh, Ethan, and he's enjoying a coffee the to-go coffee, and coming out of the backpack are coffee cup lids, thousands yeah. of those plastic disposable coffee cup lids falling out of his backpack into the water. So those are the issues that he was very concerned with. And so um, there's the URL for our program, and you can read more about different artists there. I'm also uh, just wanted to say there's an organization called WE, which is the Women Environmental Artists. Uh, directory, and both the founder of our program, Joe Hansen, and Susan Steinman, who designed our garden, were founders of Weed. They have a great website and they have an online journal, uh, and so this was uh, based on an article I had written for that journal, so that's what them. Thank you.